bit of special music, I've asked Elias to give a word of testimony uh, to come and to do so. And we're looking at Malachi this morning, Malachi chapter 3, for our scripture reading study. Now, did you enjoy the piano? Yes, sir. I love it always. It reminds me of Sister Mathis. Gail will remember Sister Mathis. Do you remember Sister Mathis? I don't think there's probably anybody else in here that, that might remember her. Uh, she's a sweet saint of God. She uh, was a member of Mount Pisgah Baptist Church with us for many years. She went to the Chicago Conservatory and uh, she uh, studied there for four or five years. And she came away from there playing like our sister. And what a blessing it was. She ended up in a convalescent home. And she said to me, Pastor David, I go to visit her. And she said, well, they still want me to play the piano. Said, but uh, I can't play it as fast as I used to. I said, that don't matter. They can't hear as fast as they used to. <laughs> All right. I thought that when our sister was playing, what a beautiful blessing to our church. Uh, Jasmine, I'm going to ask you to come with me. Just stand here. Both of you come. Let me say this to you. Pray for Jasmine. She is studying as much as 11 hours a day in preparation for the medical exam that she will be taking. We're trying to get her into Emory University. And so you pray for her that God will, will help her. All you have to do, Jasmine, is if he says anything right, just say Amen. <laughs> Well, uh, Pastor asked me to share a three-minute testimony, but uh, I'm going to try, and it's going to be wonderful. Amen. Yeah, we're trying to develop that skill for you. Amen. Speak well, up a little too, brother. Okay, brother. Uh, the Lord is good to us, and I'm grateful this morning to uh, share with you the verse that's been upon my heart even this morning. Fresh. Uh, it has come out from, from the very book of uh, uh, Deuteronomy. And even Exodus, we find the words repeated over and over. It is truly said from God to Moses and then Moses to Joshua, saying, Be strong and of good courage. So I'm glad this morning to share with you uh, that uh, there is not a whole lot of strength and courage in us, isn't it? But I tell you, this strength and courage that can be drawn from the very throne of God this morning. I'm grateful that uh, fear and, uh, uh, and its sting, the, the pain and the concern that may come about us, try to pull us down, to try to shame us. But I tell you, our God is bigger than that. Our God is greater than what we're doing, what we're facing in these days. But I just want to pause this morning and say and draw strength from our God saying, that uh, courage and strength can be found in this generation, in these days, that God is able to give us courage and strength. And if Amen. we just trust Him, if we just obey Him, if we just stay faithful to Him, I tell you, the strength and that courage that uh, we don't find anywhere uh, is given to us. And it may not be, bam, it's, it can't be allowed to us. Uh, but sometime in the calm sweetness, uh, calm, uh, that very calm assurance that it itself brings that, that comfort to us. So I comfort you with the very comfort that I was comforted with this morning from the Word of God to share with you that our God is a strong tower. Amen. Bible says to us over and over that the righteous shall run to Him because His name is a strong tower to us. And we can always rely on Him. Amen. So I'm grateful this morning to share with you in these very few minutes that I got. Me and my wife, we draw strength from the Lord. If Moses can draw strength from God, he was able to share with Joshua the very words. Be strong and of good courage. 
And it is the word for all the people of Israel yeah. suffering in the wilderness. Turning our Bibles this morning to the book of Malachi, chapter 3. <coughs> Always like for Eliezer to testify before I preach at the Atlanta City Baptist Rescue Mission. The majority of them are black gentlemen, and he really gets them turned on. I'm telling you, they get to jumping and a hopping and a praising God. And uh, then he turns it over to me, and I pray to God that I can keep them hopping. Amen. But uh, it's a real blessing to uh, see what God has stood for our brother Eliezer. Pray for him as he's seeking open doors for uh, the ministry of deputation. All right, so let's all stand, please. We're looking at Malachi chapter 3. And uh, I want us to begin, and we will begin at verse uh, 16. The Bible said, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And the, a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord. And that... Uh, thought on his name, and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, and I will share them as a man, spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him, then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Let's bow for a continued word of prayer, please. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name uh, for the privilege to be studying uh, the word of God again this morning. And we ask you, Lord, to speak clearly to our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the divine distance you brought us as a church. And Lord, I, I just stand amazed at how good you are to us. Amen. And I give adoration and praise for our families at Peachtree. Mm -hmm. And we ask thee to bless them, that you give them the desires of their hearts. And Lord Jesus, above everything, use us as a channel to exalt and glorify your name. Yeah. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. We are looking at the book of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 16 to 18 in our study today. Uh, I started uh, uh, studying with you several uh, messages ago. and We looked at the fact that in the last time that we studied together that the big problem in the days of Malachi was that the people saw no reason to repent of their sins. And I think probably that's what I'm sensing we're missing in America today. Uh, we've had so much preaching on feeling good uh, rather than sensing cleansing by the power of the shed blood of Christ. But I, I magnify him that uh, there's messages in this book that are not only dealing with sin in a very strong negative way. But this portion of scripture that I read in your hearing this morning is very positive. And it's for the remnant of God. It's for those of us that will choose to be holy and to walk in righteousness. You'll remember that Malachi was a contemporary with Haggai and Zechariah as well as Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther was during that period of time. Israel had been taken off into Babylonian captivity and they were gone for 70 years. And then God allowed them to start going back to their homeland. Uh, it's interesting that as they went back to their homeland, 
Uh, it took a lot of grace to leave uh, Babylon because of the fact that they had learned to live comfortably there. You know, one of the things that uh, happens when we get out of the will of God and God has to chase us and put us in different places, uh, we adjust. And oftentimes we learn to live comfortably in sin and in a community of sin. But let me say this to you. It's impossible to be saturated in the powers of the world and worldliness. And uh, Satan is the god of this world. He's going to use the system of this world to take us away from God. To make our hearts cold. It's interesting that uh, in uh, Matthew 24, he's talking about the tribulation period. But it also tells us in that period of time that cold hearts are taken away from the love of God. One of the saddest things that I know of is a church that has been being used of God. And I think we have. And I think we're going to be used of God. Uh, I'm very, very positive about what God's doing these days. I realize that it's a day of chastening of God upon us. And when you have leadership in the government like we have, we have to be reminded America put them into office. And that means that somebody has not been preaching and teaching in the pulpits of the land. What ought to be preached and taught is a standard of holiness for God to spare our land. Can I hear an amen? amen? This is the key. This is the understanding. I think it's uh, always beautiful when I uh, go into the college classroom and I start talking to young people uh, in the classroom about God being first and foremost holy. Because they've heard, most of them, and we have too, that God is love. And let me say this to you. He is a God of but it's not the love of this world. No. Uh, it's agape love. It's that that operates as a result of the work of God's Holy Spirit ministering through the church. Listen to me. You remove the church, you remove the salt. And you have nothing but corruption. Uh, I would pray to God that we would pursue holiness with a passion. Uh, that when we measure love, we measure it as holy love. Amen. Amen. And when we measure hatred, God's hatred is holy hatred. Uh, and God always does right. Uh, he never does wrong. And what's significant about this thing, they had been taken off into captivity because of their sin. They had ceased to keep the law of God. And they were breaking the law of God in every area. You know, once you break one area, it's easier to break a second yeah. and then a third. And it won't be long but we're as corrupt as the world. Yeah. But please understand, they uh, violated the law of God concerning the Sabbath of the land. Every seventh year, they were to let the land lie dormant. It was God's uh, program of giving rest to the land so that it could be productive and not all of the life taken out of the land. We have learned crop rotation works and we do that here but God left the law that the seventh year was to remain a year where there was no uh, plowing, no farming and of course God honored that for Israel. But let me say this to you. When they went off into captivity, you would think they learned their lesson. But uh, we see what I'm talking about with this remnant, even in Babylon. They teach us, and the Word of God teaches us, that the synagogue had its beginning in Babylon. You say, what happened? Well, we have references in Ezekiel, and of course we know that Daniel was a man that opened the windows of his house every day looking toward Jerusalem and he would intercede and pray. Let me say that those of us that are around us, we talk about it all the time. Well, what's going to happen? 
I don't know what's going to happen, but I know one thing, God's in charge. That's right. And I'm glad that I'm one of his children. And as I walk in faith and obedience to the word of God and the things of God, it is a glorious blessing to me to know that I can be the remnant of God in spite of what others are doing. Yes, sir. Daniel began to pray. He had opened the windows toward heaven. He had uh, such influence that the three Hebrew brothers, or uh, we find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they identify themselves with Jehovah God and with Daniel. Ezekiel teaches us that they gathered together in Ezekiel's home and they worship God facing Jerusalem. Let me say this to you. They can take a lot away from us. They may take our homes, our houses, and our land, but they cannot take Jesus Christ away from us. Amen. We must understand that God has a purpose for us and uh, he will use us and he'll save people in spite of the circumstances and what's going on around us. It's God's program, not Satan's. It's God's program, not the people of the world. It is God's program. And you and I both know that they had no longer got back in the land. They had started worshiping in the, in the uh, rebuilding of the temple and they were uh, blessed to have the safety of the walls that were built around the city. And the Bible tells us that they began to serve God and those that came back. And I love chapter 8 of Nehemiah. It's one of the greatest chapters on expository preaching in the Word of God. And it teaches us that Ezra, Nehemiah was not a preacher. Nehemiah was not a priest and he didn't try to act like one. But he did help build a pulpit for him, the man of God. And what was so wonderful about the thing is that the Bible tells us that when, uh, and I said this already, but I'll say it again for those of you who didn't hear it. Amen. I come walk in this pulpit every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, carrying my Bible. You say, Pastor Dave, don't you have a cell phone? I sure do. Does it have a Bible on it? Yes, but it don't look like the Bible. Right. It looks like an instrument of the world. And so I don't bring it to the pulpit. You say, why? Because I do well to read my handwritten notes. To have to lose my sermon would be a very embarrassing thing for me. But you say, Pastor David, well, there's nothing wrong with us doing that, is there? No, but if I was you, I'd lay my Bible top of it and hide it as I went to the pulpit. Uh, amen. This is a divine book. It's not just any book. It's the Word of God. And when we stand and proclaim the Word of God in faith and we proclaim it in obedience to God's commands and the people of God become hearers of the Word. And when they become hearers of the Word, that's what makes you a doer of the Word. Amen. And so the transforming work of God's grace comes. But God has always had his remnant. He had a remnant in Babylon. Uh, they had to look toward Jerusalem and pray in faith, but their confidence was in Jehovah God, and they believed in the worship of the temple. Can I hear an amen? Well, the Bible tells us that time went by. Nehemiah went back to uh work in the palace as a cupbearer of the king. And during that time while he was away, the responsibilities of being governor there were turned over to his brother. And then the Bible tells us that one by one they started going back to the same old sins. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. If you and I are not careful to keep ourselves and our families close to God and in the house of God and reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, and worshiping God, keeping ourselves holy, if we don't do that, what's going to happen is we will eventually 
be back in the same old mess that we were in before God ever saved us. You say, well, you have to get resaved. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. But I'm going to tell you, sin after you're saved is worse than sin before you were saved. Yeah, sure you say, why is that? Now you're sinning against light. Yeah. Now you're going against the Word of God and the things that God has taught you. So it's very important for us uh, <laughs> to look at the sin that they were involved in, but we also need to look at the fact they had no desire to repent. And I dealt with that Sundays ago. But let me say this to you. But there was a remnant of God that didn't want to sin. It was said about Christostom, uh, he was incarcerated for preaching the gospel. And the king, I mean, he struck out at the king in part of his ministry. And what was so interesting about the thing, they arrested him, and the king was so angry with him, said, if we can just get Christostom where he is miserable. And so he called in the head jailer and said, work on Christostom. See if you can find out if he's afraid of dying. Tell him we're going to excommunicate him and cut his head off. And the old jailer said, no, that won't work. Said, he said, if you kill me, I'll just go and be with my Lord. Well, they said, what else could we do? He said, well, we can put him in solitary confinement. And Chris Costum made this statement. He said, that'll be fine. Just put me in solitary confinement. Then it'll just be me and my Lord and I won't have any distractions. <laughs> let, let me just say this to you. They went on and searched out what would make Chris Austin sad. What would make him desire uh, to be delivered. And he looked at the old jailer that had asked him the question. He said, sir, the only thing I fear is sin. I don't want any sin in my life to separate me from communion with my God. Let me say an attitude can be sin. Let me say unbelief can be sin. Attitudes of the heart can be sin. It doesn't have to be adultery or murder. Right. Let me just say to you, God is grieved when we sin because God hates sin. And I'm coming back to this. There was a remnant that said, I want to be with my Lord. I want to commune with him. And the Lord said about them, and I love what he said, he called them a faithful remnant. And they were faithful uh, and are drawn to one another. Verse 16, it says uh, of chapter 3. Uh, then they that feared the Lord. What is the word feared? Reverenced and respect the Lord. Spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that fought upon his name. Uh, the last time we were together, I dealt with this verse. And I simply want to say to you, that the faithful are drawn together. I tell you what, you go to Vietnam like I did after being involved in the church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and you go to uh, battle and you're living in the fields. You don't have opportunity to hear preaching. You don't have opportunity to see the brethren. I'm going to tell you, it'll make a difference in your attitude when you get home yes, about your church. Some of you uh, fail to understand that Peach Street Baptist Church is a gift of God. It is to me, praise God. And I want to say this to you. It is possible for a man to lose the fellowship of God through a local church because they're not faithful to that local church. The faithful are drawn together. Amen. Uh, I don't know about you, but when you talk about somebody's faithful, I think he's talking about some of you that does righteously. 
And let me just say this in this case. The Bible says they were drawn together. I tell you, there's nothing that draws a people together than each individual drawing nigh to God and God drawing nigh to them. You see, the answer is this thing that, uh, that we have a focus and that focus is upon Jesus Christ and when one member draws nigh and another draws nigh and another draws nigh, we will be in complete unity. There will be the friendship and the fellowship of the body of Christ that you can't get anywhere else. Right. Uh, I go on to point out to you the faithful are drawn together. Uh, I'm 75 years old and since I was born, I've been in the house of God. There's times in there as a youngster that I didn't get too much out of what I was going for. But I tell you what it was doing, it was building a knowledge of the local church and her value. And then uh, what happened? Then uh, I was born again. And I realized I was one of that fellowship. And now I'm in. Amen. And what they enjoy, I enjoy. And where they go, I'm going to go. Just like Ruth's testimony with Naomi. The faithful are marked by divine fear. They have a reverence and a respect for God. The faithful talk one with another in verse 16. They talk one with another about the Lord. Amen. Uh, churches that have more conversation on sports or hunting or other things and activities or quilting or you know what I'm talking about. You got more conversations in those proper programs within than you do the fact that you're talking about the Lord. It excites me. I don't care who he is or who she is. If they want to learn the Bible and they come to me, I'm going to put forth the effort to help them learn the Bible. You say, why? Because once we come to know who God is and we fellowship with him, then we not only enjoy God and fear him and reverence him and respect him, we recognize him as a father. As it said in chapter 1, we recognize him as a master. Our desire is to be used of him in fellowship with him. And it also works not just our relationship perpendicular, but horizontal with every brother and sister in Christ. Uh, I will say this. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians. He said, uh, if any member hurts, the whole body hurts. Amen. Amen. Some of y'all remember the story that Dr. Abel Rogers told. He said, uh, he said, my wife was graduating from Baylor University and I'd already graduated from seminary and we were engaged to get married. He said, I was there on the night before her graduation. I was excited. I was standing up in a hotel. And he said, it came bedtime. He said, I ran across the room to jump in the bed. And he said, I stopped my toe on the end of one of those posts on that bed. He said, it hurt so bad. He said, I was up in the middle of the bed and my whole being was taking care of my big toe. <laughs> when we love one another, amen somebody hurts we all hurt and we're all desirous to minister and to help the, the hurt of them. Uh, let me just say to you what a blessing it is for us to understand that the faithful talk one with another who do you call when you're in trouble you call some fleece head out here that's in the world that has no knowledge of God or the word of God or the things of God or any desire to know God when you are touched and you need help you're going to find a brother and sister in Christ or a pastor that can lead you in the paths of righteousness can I, can I, can I not hear an amen that's what the family of God is 
and you don't have the family of God, you don't have it, man. I'm telling you, you're in big trouble in this world. The faithful talk one with another. Uh, the saints give each other comforting words. In 2 Corinthians, the saints give each other uh, encouragement and correction. Let me just go on to say the faithful are marked by their thoughts. The real truth of whether God has done a work of saving grace to you is when you start thinking right. When you start thinking right, when God saves you and he instructs you in the word of God, then you start thinking the Bible. You say, how can I walk with God, read this book, and put it into practice? And I'm going to tell you what's so blessed, the Holy Spirit has promised if you will practice this book, that the Holy Spirit will enable you to practice it. I, I want to go on to say study Ephesians and Colossians. That will be a good start. Add Philippians. All right, so we see that the word thought here. Look at it, verse uh, 16 again. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared or respected uh, his lordship, the Lord, and that what? Thought above his name. Well, you know, I guess one of the greatest uh, blessings that God can give anybody is uh, uh, passion to think the Word of God. And uh, that's what should be the desire of parents in bringing up their children, is to teach them to think the Word of God. Yeah. And uh, he said in Philippians 4, think on things that are pure, yeah. lovely, holy, virtuous, if there be any praise. And on down the line, you say, Pastor David, what does that mean? That means you've got to be careful of what you think about. Yeah, think right. about things that are holy. Uh, it'll save you when you're trying to think about some boy, or you're trying to think about some girl, or you're trying to think about some goal of financial prosperity that will come your way. Without all of that, you can you can, uh, you can make it, but you can't make it without Jesus. Right. And so think on Jesus. I, uh, I guess I, I give God the glory. I, I'm not talking about myself. I'm just telling you what happens. I thank the Lord all the time. And I can tell the moment I'm not thinking about the Lord. I, I got a conscience that's been prepared by God, like Brother Edgar Thomas said on one occasion. He said, I got a conscience as big as a refrigerator. And when I don't think right, God drops that refrigerator on my head. That's how we feel. I tell you one thing, the Lord chasteneth those whom he loves. Amen. Amen. And what a glorious thought and a blessing it is for us as the children of God to think right. To think on things that are pure and holy. Think on this book. Amen. But you can't think on it if you don't hide it in your heart. That's right. Amen. I want to go on to say to you, you can't think on Jesus without communing with him regularly. Yep. There has to be a time that you get up in the morning and you hide yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know what it is? I like to think of it this way, as a preparation, as a preparation to getting to the house of God. If I'm thinking right when I go to the house of God, I get more out of it. If I pray right, I get more out of it. Amen? And uh, so, uh, let me just say this to you. This was a remnant of God. And they were thinking on Jesus. They were thinking of the truths in his word that pointed out that God is faithful. About the time when my mother passed away, uh, 
I had a scene, great is thy faithfulness. My little mother, when she was dying, uh, I stayed with her three days, came back home, preached, and I go, went back uh, knowing that she was dying and that she wouldn't live. So as I, I went in and began to share the Word of God with her and everything, and I said to her, I said, uh, Jesus is all you need. If you're crossing, Jesus is all you need. She looked up at me and he, she said, hadn't I had a good life? You know, when you're pressing a dying pill, there's a lot of things you don't want to remember. That's your old sin. Am I right with God? Am I ready to go meet God? Let me just say this. Praise be to God. My little mother said, I've had a good life. You know what she was remembering? The shepherd that had been following her. Let me just say this to you. When our thoughts in this life are stayed upon the Lord, we will love him and appreciate him even in our death. Yeah. Uh, we can look back and say what? There's a book of remembrance. Yes. God's been recording all this. God's in charge of this. Hey, I can't, I don't worry about seeing him. He's got it written down. And he knows that I had a desire to know him and to fellowship with him and be involved with the local church that he had put me in. I thank God. And let me just say, he sustains us. He loves us. Think of those things. Ponder. He is our provider, our shepherd, our refreshment, our purity, our righteousness, our godliness, our life, our peace, our power. <laughs> to be honest with you, right thinking is a must in those last days. Yep. If we are yeah. to stand for the glory of God, Satan battles our minds, but God keeps our minds. And let me say this yep. to you. And I, I, I've given it already this week, and I may have given it last week, I don't care. But what's interesting is, there was a throne of people following after Jesus. And his disciples were with him. And there's a little lady, a woman, that had a bloody issue. She had cancer. And she'd been all that she had. And she said, if I can just reach through and touch the hem of his garment. I'm going to tell you, those that are the remnant of God are those that are utilizing the communion and fellowship and the touching of the hem of his garment to help them through. And all of a sudden, she's healed. <laughs> Faith touched the Lamb of God, and she was healed. And he turned around and he said, who touched me? Oh. The disciples said, what do you mean who touched? Everybody's been crawling. Let me tell you, there's a difference in a remnant and the crowds of religions. Yes, sir. Religion is so thrown the Lord, but none of them touch him. That's the reason we need to be encouraged to know that it's not the big crowds. Uh, but I do believe that in those big crowds, oftentimes he'll have a remnant. And they're trying to reach the hem of his garment. And then the Bible tells us in verse 16, and the Lord hearkened. All of a sudden, the Lord Jesus looks around and touches him. The Lord hears our prayers. The Lord hears our thoughts. And he hearkens unto the conversation we have one with my question for you this morning is this. How much time do you talk to your wife or your husband about the Lord? I was blessed by Sunday when uh, Dylan came in for Dr. Seelis' birthday and brought his newly engaged 
be honest, say. And you just have to have not deal with it like I have through the years. I used to take it to camp when he was that big. And then he got so big he was taking me to camp. <laughs> but uh, it was always a blessing to be around. And uh, I said to him, I said, uh, Dylan, I want to talk to you a little bit before you get this marriage done. <laughs> he said, okay. I said, uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in is that Jesus Christ is number one in this home. Oh, yes. I love him. I want him to be that way. Amen. But do you know the first thing that we lose in our husband and wife relationship when we go south? Some of us say finances, and I'll say okay to that. Finances will really stop up the lines of communication. But communication is the first thing that goes. And after a while, you stop talking. If you stop talking about the Lord and the things of God, you will stop communicating to one another about the basics. Yes, sir. Now what's going to happen? You're going to end up without a uh, source of strength. But let me say this to you. If you give yourself to God, communicate with God. That's prayer. That's a means of grace that he's given. Mm -hmm. The word of God is the word of God. He speaks to us from this book. You don't hear him, you won't know how to respond to him. He'll guide you in the paths of righteousness. The Lord heart. <laughs> that speaks of the sensitivity of his hearing. He can hear a deer with, with an issue of blood while others are thronging around. Mm. All over the world there are men that are thronging around God. Let me just say that there were Jews worshiping supposedly all around, but only a remnant was hearkened unto. God doesn't hearken to everybody. He hearkens to that remnant. So, it's old fashioned, but the idea by this Hebrew word is is uh, Hunter's word. I may have used this before, but it's worth saying it again because we got hunters here that need to hear it. Have you ever known that a dog can hear sounds you can't hear? And uh, you'll be working with him, trying to get him ready to go run the rabbits. Amen. And he comes out. And in a few minutes you look at him and his ears stand up. That's right. And the idea of that ear being standing up means he's hearing something somewhere. And you know what happened? You'll watch it and that ear will turn. He's turning in on the sound to get the answer. Let me just say this to you. That's what God's talking about here. God said, you love me, you live for me, and you're faithful to the house of God and to follow the word of God and pray. He said, what's going to happen is God will hear and he will hearken. Praise be to God. I've tried God out for the last few weeks. I won't tell you. And if I'm doing wrong, I'm begging God to forgive me. But I get up early and uh, I read the Word of God and I pray. Yeah. <clears throat> Two weeks ago, we needed $15,000 for the Middle East. We had 2,000 of them come in and make me just want to tap dance. But 2,000 of them came in. This is two weeks ago. And I was praying, communing with my God. And he spoke clearly to my heart. I want you to go down there, take the money out of your savings, and give X number of dollars. 
I went down and gave, I don't care to tell you, I gave $500. The next morning, am I lying or am I dying? A $5,000 check came in. I thought, Lord, I'm willing to do 500 more if you'll do 5,000. <laughs> Amen. So I came in and I was praying specifically, Lord, we need this money. And uh, I put 200 more in. And believe it or not, it is now up to $8,000. You said, gosh, stay away. You're talking about just listening. He'll hearken to you. Talk to him. Amen. Ask him for the things that you desire. And he'll give you stuff that will be far beyond anything that you even thought of mm -hmm. or could imagine. Amen? Mm -hmm. So this morning, I don't have a lot of money, but I, I gave 500 more this morning. I'm asking God for at least 5,000 more. You say, preacher, you don't give to give. I know that. But he heard it. He's hearkening unto it. We're begging God to take care of worldwide evangelism in a part of the world where it's hostile. But he's still God. He's still God. So you say, Pastor Dave, what do you say? To us? He said, he heard. And uh, it means that he hovered over and listened to every word. Uh, when it says in here, this thing all point to another, he put together a book of remembrance. Uh, I like that word that he heard. He like this too. He puts his hand over his ears to make sure he hears every word you're saying. That's the way I have to pray. But I can't hear no more. So I just say, Lord, hear me. And uh, Lord, I'm glad I don't have to hear you, but I want to hear you. And he'll speak to me through the word of God. He always does. You say, Pastor David, this is, this is so simple. Aren't you glad? We get it so complicated. And we miss all that God has for us. Amen. Let's stay.